So good morning, everyone. My name is Fred Sienekal. I'm the head of R&D here at Learning Machines. Um, it's quite a um, great privilege for us today to be hosting this webinar series. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it. So thank you all for joining. I think we've probably got a number of local guests here from South Africa. And I'm sure there's also a couple of international guests. Um, so thank you for taking the time. So some of my co-hosts for the day, um, and we'll have a panel discussion a bit later. Uh, Lionel Bishop, our CAO and founder, and then a number of our data scientists and solution architects. We've got Afan, Tadisa, Cole, and Gabriel. And later on, we'll do a Q&A session. Um, so we'll maybe spend the first 30 minutes or so discussing natural language processing. And then we'll do a quick uh, question and answer session. All right, so this is, this is a five-part series. We're going to talk about natural language processing and chatbots in this specific webinar. And then in two weeks' time, we'll follow on with text processing and search. We'll also have a bit of a look at speech and voice processing, followed by OCR, and then finally image and voice processing, video processing. So if you guys want to join any of these webinars, please register on our website at uh, www.learningmachines.co.za. So today we will be speaking about natural language processing together with chatbots and conversational agents, which is, which is quite a hot topic. And we'll introduce two of the web services that's available through Amazon, namely Amazon Comprehend, which focuses on natural language processing, and Amazon Lex, which is their service for uh, conversational agents. Now, one of, the, one of the developments that I'm sure everyone will agree on is the massive growth in data. Um, data currently is growing exponentially. And if you look sort of at the, the current state of affairs, we're sitting at roughly somewhere between 40 and 50 zettabytes of information. This is a study which was done by Seagate. Obviously, these guys have to provide hard disks to, to fill the needs of the world. And by their predictions, in about 2025, we'll sit at something like 175 zettabytes of information. So information will quadruple within the next five years. And coupled with that, we'll have to be able to process that data and build infrastructures that can cope with the demands for, for digital data. Now, if we look at the amount of data that's available in the world, most of the data is actually in an unstructured form. So if you think about structured data, most companies are probably quite familiar with things like spreadsheets or databases. Um, data that end up in data warehouses or data marts or other specialized data structures, which are forms of structured data. On the other hand, a lot of the world's data exists in different forms of data, which is, which is unstructured, such as text, a voice or audio, image and video. And of course, you can think about things like IoT devices, which generate a lot of information um, and will be doing so ever more in future. So the, a lot of inherent value actually exists in these unstructured data sources. And uh, by being able to process this data, we can unlock some of those insights and improve our business processes. So this webinar and the next one will specifically focus on text. And then the next uh, three webinars will then focus more on the voice and audio and the image and video. And so for this specific webinar series, we're going to look at some of the, the processing that goes into unstructured data. Um, and maybe, maybe in a later webinar series, we'll look more into structured data again. So where, where do these text data sources come from? And if you think about the organizations that you work for, a lot of it is probably in, in some of your custom interactions. So if you think about things like emails, um, most businesses are probably still operating on a lot of email that get, get sent to and fro. And particularly in attachments in these emails, there, there exists quite a bit of information. We find with the customers that we work with, um, a lot of the content is actually embedded in, in 
attachments and the ability to be able to get to those attachments and process the emails correctly is actually something that can improve the businesses quite a bit. But it's not the only, the only channel. Of course, there's things like SMSs or instant messaging. If you can think about people that's chatting online, call centers, which generate quite a number of notes and logs. If you think about things like voice transcriptions from those call center operators, or if you have meetings um, and you're recording those uh, meetings, of course, that can be transcribed into text. Things like customer surveys, um, which also generates quite a bit of text information. Now, of course, most of your employees would be creating things like company reports or presentations. And depending on the industry that you are in, there might be lots of additional sources. You think about things like legal documents or evidence that's presented in the legal industry, or medical reports, or doctor's notes, if you, for instance, are insurance. Um, might be quite applicable. And of course, what your customers are saying about you in, in the world is also quite important. So if you think about sites where people give ratings and reviews about your company or about your products, um, social media where people mention you and it might be in a positive or a negative way, online communities where people discuss your products and things like news and media where you feature. And all of these text sources um, can be processed and can tell a lot about your company and how people perceive you. Now, to deal with all of this information, um, the branch of artificial intelligence called natural language processing, or NLP for, uh, for short, deals with, with this interactions between computers and, and humans, and particularly human natural language. And it's been a a field of research which has been going on for quite some time, even since the 1950s with Alan Turing and things like uh, the Turing which test. Um, people have been trying to develop techniques to be able to understand human language and to process it in some way. I think the ultimate objective here is the ability to, to read and decipher and really to, to understand what humans are saying. In, in such a way that it's valuable for us um, and we can actually use it within our organizations and our businesses. So just a couple of examples of what natural language processing entails. Um, we're probably all quite familiar with something like spelling correction. If you have a word processor, um, it's something that you probably use every day. One thing that I use quite often is something like predictive uh, text, if I write an email, um, the editors are quite good at figuring out what I'm trying to say and suggesting good phrases that I might use in an email. Things like spam detection has been around for, for quite some time. Um, probably many of us are not even aware of it because it works so well. And then there are other sort of at the, at the word level type NLP tasks such as um, Part of speech tagging or named entity recognition, which have been quite well researched and at that this stage get probably very, very good results, um, probably in the order of 99.9% um, cl correct classification or so. And so some of these, these types of problems have been quite well solved. Now, if we look at the sort of sentence level, there's a number of interesting tasks such as sentiment analysis, where you're trying to predict whether someone has, is expressing positive or negative sentiment. Um, this has also been one of the tasks which recently have, have been um, quite well done. Machine translation, there's interesting neural net models which can do neural machine translation, um, giving you the ability to actually understand what people in a different language can say. And, and different other tasks, such as word sense ambigu disambiguation, um, or pronoun resolution, where we're trying to get a good feeling for what, what certain words mean in a certain context. So, for instance, in that example there, um, we're quite good at understanding that the word mouse there means a computer mouse instead of a, a real rodent. Where these NLP techniques struggle a bit is in terms of the semantic understanding of language um, and tasks such as summarization, 
um, is, is still quite difficult for, for these NLP techniques to do. So if you imagine, for instance, something like uh, text such as that the credit rating of South Africa has been downgraded and the unemployment rate is quite bad and uh, people are struggling under the current COVID regulations, that might be summarized as the economy is bad, but it's still quite difficult for a machine to understand that. Um, things like question answering and computer dialogue and chatbots that we will be talking about today, still a number of difficult problems for computers to understand. Now, the reason some of these tasks are quite difficult um, is that language in many cases is quite ambiguous. It's not so easy to understand what people are saying and it also requires a bit of context. So if we take an example here, like the thieves stole the paintings. Now, if the sentence following that were something like they were sold, as humans, it would be quite natural for us to understand what is meant by the word they there. It probably refers to the paintings. Um, and it's quite natural for us to make that association within the context. However, if the sentence following it was they were caught, the word they there would be interpreted quite differently. And you might then imagine that it was the thieves that were caught rather than the paintings, although we use the same word in context there. If it was something like they were found, it would actually be quite difficult to understand what the word they mean there in context. It might refer to the thieves or it might refer to the paintings. And language is quite ambiguous in that regard. And if the sentence following where they caught them, well, the they there could refer to something like the police. And that would actually depend on your whole reference frame and prior knowledge that you have to be able to understand that. And so the difficulty in, in creating language models was for computers to be able to incorporate all of this prior information about the world. And to solve language understanding, um, would require then a lot more about understanding relationships about things that happen in the real world. Now, at the moment, some of the state-of-the-art algorithms can actually do quite well. Um, one of the, one of the uh, data sets that people typically test on is what is called the um, Stanford Question Answering Data Set. And over the last two years or so, the algorithms that people have developed are starting to have human-like performance or even better human than human performance. And the way these models work is to try and create mathematical representations of language. And there's a number of these sort of models that people develop, things like ALMO or BERT or GPT. And they try to capture the relationships that's inherent in, in text. And then based on that, create some vector representation um, to, quanti to, to encode language. Now, most of them are trained by doing multiple language tasks simultaneously. Um, and that actually improves their performance quite, quite, a, quite a bit. Now, one, one important thing about these language models is that they're able to do something called transfer learning. And in transfer learning, you don't need to retrain these massive neural nets from scratch if you want to apply it to a new problem. Um, you can simply retrain it on a small portion of data, and it's then quite capable of generalizing to, to the new examples that you have. Now, if we just take a step back and say, well, how, how can we then apply all of this natural language processing within our businesses? Um, there's three areas which we've identified, which, which seems to be the main ones. The first one being customer analytics and interaction. So the ability to understand what your customers are saying about you, and then to assist them with the interactions that they have with you through things like chatbots or, in, or extracting information um, from what they are saying. The second one being in terms of workflow and productivity. So the ability for your employees to be able to um, up their productivity through things like spell checking or predictive text, or um, the ability, for instance, to do email routing or spam detection 
um, from incoming emails. And then the third area where natural language processing has been applied quite substantially is in knowledge discovery and management. Um, so if you are generating quite a bit of information within your company, you might have different systems with which people can interact. Um, there might be different ways in which you can use text-based systems to extract that information. For instance, tagging documents, um, classifying them, things like question answering systems to extract information from, from your corporate and enterprise data warehouses and so forth. Now, the system, uh, the service from Amazon that actually makes natural language processing possible is called Amazon Comprehend. And it's a fully managed system um, or NLP service from them, meaning you don't have to provision your own service. You can just uh, use the service from them um, through things like REST APIs or SDKs. Now, their models are powered by deep learning. Um, and they are continuously trained and quite quite accurate. And I think probably the, the biggest advantage is that you can just use these systems and interface with them without having to have quite a lot of knowledge about NLP. At the moment, there's seven different language tasks, and I'll just quickly take you through them. Um, the first one being language detection. And so the ability of the computer to predict what the input language is. So you can imagine if you have something like a customer review, you'd like to take that review and understand in which language it was written um, so that you can do further processing on that. Or for instance, um, if a customer is in a, conversing with you in a different language, you might want to detect that and then use machine translation to be able to interact with that customer, even though he speaks a different language. Second task is sentiment analysis. And here it's about understanding whether the, the sentiment uh, expressed is either positive or negative um, and how people are feeling about your company or your products. So here's an example of a couple of reviews from a certain product on Amazon. Um, the first one was rated five stars. And if you run it through the sentiment analysis uh, code, it gives a very, very high positive sentiment. The second one here being quite a negative statement, uh, it received one star. And again, when you run it through these sentiment analysis algorithms, you get quite a negative sentiment. Now, the third one here being quite interesting, um, the person has quite mixed feelings, although he feels that the product is working quite well, he feels that the remote is quite terrible. Um, later on, he says that you know it's quite cute and it probably won some of the design awards but the functionality is crap and on analysis there the person is actually expressing uh, mixed feelings about it and so you can see 87 percent mixed feelings while um, quite a bit less in terms of sort of positive or negative sentiment that is being expressed now named entity recognition is all about identifying things like people locations uh, quantities and so forth within uh, text. So if we take this example here about learning machines being a Johannesburg-based company and applying named entity recognition to it, um, it will identify uh, learning machines being a company name, Johannesburg as a place, uh, our founder Lionel Bishop as a person, and then a date there. Um, or if we take a bit of a different example there about Amazon, you can see all the different named entities being identified. And this is very, very useful if you're trying to extract information from what people are saying. So which people were involved in a certain transaction, where did it occur, when did it occur, what was the amounts involved. Um, and if you integrate it into your systems, this can be quite, quite useful. Key phrases and part of speech tagging is another uh, ability of Amazon Comprehend. So here the idea is to be able to understand what are the important phrases within the text data um, and then also to classify things like what actions are taking place like verbs and nouns and so forth. Quite good I must say with my children's school homework um, and within the context of organizations this would probably be taken up in 
larger systems. Now, topic modeling is, is quite an interesting um, aspect of Amazon Comprehend. And the idea here is to be able to, in an unsupervised way, cluster different documents and to understand what they are all about. So if you, for instance, take something like news articles, those news articles might speak to a variety of topics. Um, if you think about what's currently in the news, things like the coronavirus or AI tech or tweets from Donald Trump might be quite relevant. And so a single news article might speak to a number of these simultaneously. And each of these topics then um, might be associated with a number of words which are quite indicative of these topics. So Amazon Comprehend gives you the ability to, to upload a large number of these documents to the bucket system uh, is free. And you then also specify a number of in topics that you'd like to um, apply the topic modeling to. And it will then give you up to 10 different words per topic. And then also the probabilities that certain documents belong to certain topics or certain topics belong um, or associated with certain words. And this is, this is quite useful if you have a large body of text that you want to analyze um, by itself and find relationships in, within those um, sets of documents. It also gives you the ability to do custom classification. So if you have certain tasks, we're trying to classify text, um, Amazon Comprehend can do that for you. And there's two modes which they provide. The first one being multi-class mode where a single document might be associated with a single class. So if you take something like email routing within the organization and you are trying to predict where an email must be routed, um, some of them might be routed, say, for instance, to a customer support uh, department, or some of them might be uh, directed to a sales department and so forth. It does also give you the probabilities. So um, you might then see that in some cases, some of these documents might be associated with more than one department, but typically there'll be a single, uh, single clause that's mostly associated with that document. The, the, other, the other mode which they provide is a multi-label mode. So suppose you want to, for instance, build something like a custom sentiment analysis. You've maybe given out some surveys and people have uh, associated themselves with a number of different ways in which they feel about your product. Um, then you might train a classifier using the classification system uh, to then associate multiple sentiments with a single document. All right, so if we just move on to chatbots. Um, chatbots are conversational agents. I think the topic has been around for a couple of years now. We're probably over the hype that was generated about chatbots and people saying that it will solve all your problems. And so realistically, I think what people have come to realize now is that in many cases, chatbots can actually improve your workflow quite a bit can save you a lot of time in terms of answering people's questions or to do things like making bookings for you. And so, so by some estimates provided here by IBM, um, up to 80% of routine questions can actually be answered by chatbots. And I think that then comes down to a cost saving where you don't need to employ people to sit with the sort of mundane tasks. You can employ them to help with the more difficult tasks and uh, difficult questions that people ask. So if we look at different use cases, um, things like information bots, where people might just want to gather information, like saying you're frequently asked questions or ask questions about current news or current weather. Um, call center bots, where people might want to interact with your systems. So requests to change things like personal details or request their balance or schedule an appointment with uh, one of your salespeople. On the other hand, there might be things like digital assistants, which provide you the, the ability to interact um, with tasks such as booking tickets or ordering food. Enterprise productivity bots, um, which is really about your employees being able to 
interactive systems to gather knowledge. So for instance, to check the sales data or marketing performance. And then finally, um, a large class of bots is about the Internet of Things. So if you think about home automation and some of the products that you might find in your home to um, automatically say, for instance, uh, change the lights or the sound or uh, open doors or so forth. Or if you think about things like wearables or the ability now to start vehicles with voice, all of those types of things might be examples of the Internet of Things. Now, Amazon provides us with Amazon Lex, which is a fully managed service from AWS. It also powers Alexa. And really, it's about conversational interfaces um, using text and voice. Um, it gives you the ability to, to model the tasks that you might find in, in a number of these use cases that I've just mentioned. Particularly, it does automatic speech recognition to convert your input voice into text. And it also then gives you the ability to really understand what is being said within the language that is being provided. Now, Lex interfaces with a number of other systems. So, for instance, Amazon Poly, which is their text-to-speech capability, Comprehend to do things like sentiment analysis, Lambda, which is their serverless um, framework for doing business logic execution, and then also Amazon Connect, which is the cloud contact center. What's quite nice about, about Lex is the ability to deploy it to various services. So for instance, um, provide you one-click integrations with things like Facebook Messenger, Slack, and Twilio. And then also through the SDKs, uh, you can quite easily integrate with your web applications or uh, your mobile applications. Now, the process of building a bot in Lex, um, one starts by configuring different uh, entities, such as your intents and your slots and your business logic. Once that configuration is complete, you might want to build your, your bot, um, which really means training the, the uh, machine learning models that drive the bot. Test it to make sure that your functionality and logic works, and you might then complete the cycle where based on what you find in your tests, you reconfigure and rebuild. And then finally, you will deploy these bots, which means creating a version and alias for the bot, and then deploying it to one of the channels that you might select. Now, in, in the Amazon Lex world, the bot is really a um, series of what is called intents. An intent is something that you'd like to do or an action that you'd like to affect in the world. So, for example, answering a FAQ, buying a coffee, or booking a hotel might all be a certain intent. And so you would specify these intents um, that you'd like your bot to do. And one of these intents then would consist of another of things that you'd have to configure for that intent. So, for instance, you'd have to provide examples that might be associated with that intent in order to trigger the intent to be processed. You might require certain information. So, for example, if you're buying a coffee, um, you might want to then find out from the user what type of coffee and what is the size of the coffee that you should get. Um, in addition, there might be certain session attributes. So, for example, um, who is the user or what is the associated credit card information to buy the coffee. And then finally, you'd also have to specify the business logic for uh, implementing that request. So let's take you for an example here. Um, suppose your user provides a sentence like, I want to buy a coffee, which can either be typed or it might be spoken. And uh, Amazon uh, Lex would then convert that spoken uh, voice into a, a text representation. The chat engine would then associate that input with the intent to buy coffee. Of course, there might be different ways in which you can state that you want to buy a coffee. All of those would trigger the same intent. Once that's done, um, you start with what is called slot filling which is then to be able to get additional information from your user, which will be necessary to fill your intent, such as the coffee type or the coffee size. 
And so it will generate a request for the user to specify what type of coffee you would like, for instance, a latte or a cappuccino. Um, the user would reply and you would fill out all the necessary slots um, in order to fulfill that intent. Once that's done, um, the way the Amazon Lex is structured, it, you can then provide a confirmation prompt to ask the user to confirm um, whether to proceed with the intent. And then once the user does the confirmation, you would then execute your fulfillment logic. And then based on that, you might give a final response to the user. And these responses or messages then can come from different message groups. Um, you might have the opportunity there to start the start the user on a different path and maybe to start with another intent. So if he's offered a coffee, he might be interested in, in buying something to eat as well. And so he might ask a question for the user to um, prompt him to start with a different intent as well. So let's do a quick live demo of the system. Um, what I've got here is some of the code that we've written to integrate with Amazon uh, Comprehend, Amazon Lex. So if we take, let's take an example here about Amazon and we do an analysis of the code there. Um, you can see that in terms of language detection, this statement here, Amazon is located in Seattle and was founded by Jeff Bezos. Um, obviously that is an English uh, language. We do have a look at the sentiment here. You can see it's a quite neutral sentiment, um, nothing too positive or too negative. You can also see uh, that um, it finds different named entities, so different organizations, different locations, people, and date there. Um, key phrases, and then of course things like your syntax analysis. So if we take something like a like a live, let's maybe do a bit of a live demo here. I've got the Wikipedia page of Elon Musk. Um, and if I say take a sentence or two here, let's go up to here. Um, let's copy this. And let's do an analysis here. We can see um, English, neutral sentiment, and you can see all the different entities that was identified. So he was born to a Canadian mother, South African father, Musk, comes from Pretoria, studied at the University of Pretoria, um, and so forth. Now, if we move on to something like, like the chatbots here, um, one of the first things we might want to be able to do is to just provide simple examples of how we might trigger intents. So for instance, if I type something like the word hi and ask the chatbot for a response, which we get there, maybe let me just make the screen a little bit smaller so that you can see more clear. Um, in order for this process to happen in the background, we would have to specify something that picks up on the fact that people have the intent of saying hello and then to reply with an appropriate response or appropriate message um, based on that. So if I say hi, um, the same intent might be triggered through a word such as hello. And there might be a different response that we've programmed there, but all of them would be associated with the same intent. Now, if you think about chatbots, very good for things like informational purposes. So if we ask a question, for instance, uh, who is learning machines? Um, the chatbot might then come back with a pre-programmed response saying in this case, learning machines is a consultancy form specializing in big data machine learning and cloud services. You might program the um, chatbot then to give maybe more than one response in, in, um, in response to a single intent or a single utterance. So for instance, if we say who created you, there might be multiple responses um, being generated in response to a single intent that was triggered. Now, if we talk about things like business logic, 
Um, obviously, you would like to connect your chatbot to some business logic in the background. So if we take an example, for instance, for let's say, what is the time? In the background, um, it would connect the business logic, which takes the current time. And based on that can give you a response uh, about the current time. Now, of course, if you ask the question in a different way, it might trigger the same response, although the utterance that you used were, were quite a bit different. Now, if we talk about something like, like slot filling, let's do an example of that. Um, let's say in this example, I've set it up to be able to order something like a pizza. So I want to order pizza. Based on that, it recognizes my intent to order a pizza and then it might start to prompt me for certain additional information that it wants. So in this case, um, it might state, for instance, the types of pizzas that's available. Now, if I specify, in this case, the type of pizza, it might then try to fill the next slot. So for instance, asking me whether I want a large, medium, or small pizza. I say medium, and if you complete the process, it might then come back with a confirmation pr prompt to ask me whether I would like to proceed with my order. And once I say yes, it might then execute the business logic in the background and then inform me that my order has been completed. Okay, I think that's uh, about the amount of time that we have available. So I think let's uh, start with our Q&A session. So if you have any questions, maybe if you can just raise a hand and then we, we might give you an opportunity to ask some questions.